Right, call to order for the uh, Fayette County Board of Education work session on November 4th at 7 p.m. Um, are there any changes to the agenda? No, sir. The agenda has been shared with the board. I would recommend you approve as submitted. Need a motion and a second? So moved. Second. All in favor? 5 0. All right, well, we, we'll start off with our presentations. Uh, we are. Uh, proud to have uh, uh, Mr. Brian Bertera and Ms. Amy Henley today. They're going to share with you some, what I think is some really good news as far as the district's performance with our college and career uh, performance index. That information was released last week and made public. So, uh, Mr. Bertera, we'll let you take off with that. All right. Good evening. Um, the first document that Kay's pulling up is just an overview of CCRPI um, to answer any questions that you or the public may have had about the different components of CCRPI. You'll remember that CCRPI was redesigned last year, so this is our second year of um, this new CCRPI score. And contrary to what you may have heard or read, um, these scores are comparable to last year. The metric hasn't changed from last year to this year, so these scores are comparable. Um, and we'll talk about each of those components as we go through um, the presentations. Okay, do you wanna pull up the elementary school? All right, and Kay, if you'll find the um, page that has content mastery on it. There we go. All right, so content mastery, um, formerly under the old CCRPI, this is the only metric that didn't change, and we called this the weighted achievement rate, okay? And so while we changed names from weighted achievement rate to content mastery, the way it's calculated remained the same, all right? And so um, beginning learners, which is a student who earns a score of one on the milestones, we receive zero points for that student. A student that is developing or a level two, we receive a half a point. A student that's proficient or a level three, we receive one point. And a student that, that is distinguished, we receive one and a half points. And those students are level four students, okay? So we add up all of those points and we divide by the number of students in each subject area. And that's how we get our um, weighted achievement or the content mastery score. Okay, now those are capped at 100. ESSA said we have to cap their scores at 100. So those schools that you see that received 100 points, um, if you look at the CCRPI report online, you'll see 100 plus, and that means their score was higher than 100 in those areas, okay? We weight each area based on the number of tests that the students take, and so at the elementary and middle school, um, English language arts and math comprise six of the eight tests, and so those are three-eighths apiece. Science and social studies are each one-eighth apiece because those are at the, um, we just test in fifth and eighth grade, okay? Okay, do you want to go to the page that shows the progress? All right. So progress is where we look at students and compare those students to their academically similar peers. And by academically similar, we mean a student that scored the exact same on the milestones as the year before, okay? So you can imagine that a student in Fayette County that scored 800, there are tens of thousands of students across the state that scored an 800. We look at what those students do the next year and we rank those from highest to lowest and we put them in order and then um, depending on where they fall from the first percentile to the 99th percentile is how we award points. And again, students that are in those lowest percentiles, it's the first through the 29th percentile, earn zero points. And then as we go up, we earn a half a point, one point, and one and a half. We divide by our number of students, and that's where those come from. Again, this is capped at 100%. And... Um, if we have, if a student doesn't have English language learners enough to create a subgroup, then we count the ELA and the math at 50% apiece. If there is enough, if we have 15 students to create the subgroup, then um, the English language learner percent is 10%, and then we get 45 for the other two, 45% for the other two categories. 
The progress for the English language learners is based on the access assessment, so not directly related to milestones, but growth on the access test, which is our test that EL students take. All right. Okay, will you pull up the closing the gaps? All right. Closing the gaps looks at how students perform in each subgroup area. Okay, and um, the baseline year for these was the 2016 test and the state um, asked that schools increase 3% a year and so the flags are determined based on if schools march towards that target or not. Schools that meet the target get a green flag. Stars that make progress but do not quite meet the target get a yellow flag. Schools that stay the same or go backwards get a red flag. And then in the subgroups of English um, learners, economically disadvantaged, and students with disabilities, if a school receives 6% growth in that area, then the school gets one and a half points. Okay. Okay, the next one would be... Um, the readiness. Yep. All right. So readiness is um, different at the elementary and middle school level from the high school level. In elementary and middle school, we look at literacy. And the way that number is derived is we look at the students who are at the midpoint or higher on the milestones for their Lexile score. And so if a student is at the midpoint or higher, we receive credit for that student. If not, then we do not. We add up the students that we receive credit for and divide it by the total number of students and that percentage is our readiness score. All right. Attendance is we get receive credit for a student if the student is absent less than 10% of the enrolled days. And um, beyond the core is students who are participating in um, a fine arts or a world language at the elementary level. And all three of those are weighted equally towards the readiness score. All right, okay, the summary page. So for elementary and middle school, content mastery is 30%, progress is 35, closing the gaps is 15, and readiness is 20. And that's how we receive um, the final cumulative CCRPI score. Okay. You can see there that our elementary average was an 87.9 for all of our elementary schools. Okay, hey, will you go to the um, first page in that presentation? Um, I think it's the first page that has the star. Yes. So we're going to touch um, more on this towards the end of the presentation, and Amy will come up here. But included with each level is also the score on the star climate rating. Remember that the star climate rating doesn't help or hurt a CCRPI score. It's just an additional piece of information. And you'll see there um, the different categories that help to influence or to um, lost my words that help to come. Thank you. <laughs> Calculate that average score. Um, it comes from survey data that students, parents, and teachers take. Discipline data that comes from Infinite Campus. The safe and substance-free learning environment. At the elementary school, that information is based on what's in Infinite Campus. At the middle and high school level, it's based on the, what's in Infinite Campus reported as discipline, as well as additional information from the student survey, the attendance, and then um, schools earn five bonus points for being a CCRPI score, school. And then we have our um, score there and the star climate rating. It's okay if you'll pull up middle school and then go to just the summary page. I think it's up one. There we go. Yep. All right, so here's our, there are middle school CCRPI scores. You'll see the um, middle school average was a 94.8 and each of our five middle schools are represented there. And then K, the high school. All 
High school is a little different in that we include graduation rate in there, and we've talked about graduation rate before, so this is not new information. But the graduation rate calculation is influenced by the four-year graduation rate, which is 80%, and then the five-year graduation rate, which is 20%. And then, Kay, if you'll pull up the readiness for the high schools, because that's a bit different as well. All right, the readiness for our high schools, again, the literacy is based on that, um, the Lexile level for the ninth grade students that take the milestones and the 11th grade students. The attendance is calculated the same way. The accelerated enrollment looks at the percent of students that have earned um, dual enrollment or AP credit. And that number is benchmarked. Okay, so that's at the 75th percentile. The benchmark is the 75th percentile of students from across the state. So if we have schools that were above the 75th percentile, those schools have earned 100 points there. Students that are below the 75th percentile, we look at that rate and divide it by the 75th percentile, and that's how we get that score for the readiness. The pathway completion, we look at students that complete an advanced academic pathway, a CTAE pathway, a world language pathway, or a fine arts pathway. And then the readiness for college and career is based on the previous year's class, okay? So now we're talking about students that graduated in 2018. This is one piece of um, a lagging indicator for CCRPI. And the reason for that is because we have to get information from the University System of Georgia and the Technical College System of Georgia to be able to calculate that score. So we look at students that enrolled and did not need remediation. We look at students who scored um, a three or higher on two AP exams or students who reached a ready, what the state considers a readiness score on the ACT and the SAT. Okay. Any questions about CCRPI or how that's calculated before we? Hey Brian, yes. Could you define what the flags mean again? The yes, red and the absolutely. Okay, will you just pull up the flags for the high school? There we go. Okay. So in 2016, based on a school's performance on the milestones, we got, we um, the state developed a target and the way that target was developed is let's say the weighted achievement rate for a particular subject was 60. The state took the difference of 160, 160 from 100 and that's a difference of 40. We found 3% of that so that's 1 and 2 tenths. Okay, 40 times 3% is 1 and 2 tenths. We took that 60 and we add the 1 and 2 tenths onto that. Okay, so the target for 2017 would have been 61.2. All right. So if a school increased above that, then they get the green flag. All right. In the ED, EL, and SWD, they would have to double that fixed point increase to get a green flag with a gold star. Okay. So if a school does really well, let's say the school went from 60 to 70. The next year, that target is 71.2. Okay. If they go from 60 to 50, the next year, that score that they have to increase to is 51.2. So that increase stays the same for five years and then we recalculate. Okay. Does that help? Yep. And the yellow and, fly, yellow and red mean they didn't make the... Yellow means they didn't meet the target but they made improvements towards the target. Red means that no improvement was noted okay. the, or they went backwards Okay. for that particular year. Right. So Brian on yes. that one, so like if we take a school that has, they have some green flag, they have some yellow and red, mm -hmm. does that mean just different students in different categories? Is that what that is? It's each subgroup is um, calculated differently, yes. So our subgroups, we have um, all students, white students, Asian, African American, students with disabilities, Hispanic, um, English learners, economically Economic disadvantaged, yeah. American, <clears throat> Indian, Alaskan, I think those are our, our subgroups. So, so anywhere a student can fall is considered a subgroup. And you have to have at least 15 of those. You have to have at least 15, correct. Can, can a student um, be in multiple subgroups? A student yes. can be in multiple subgroups. And this is by subgroups, not by subject. That's correct. Is it subject and subgroups? It is subject and subgroups. Okay. So English language arts has 
a chance to earn all of those subgroups if a, stu if a school has enough. In some of our elementary schools, you'll see in um, science and social studies, they didn't have an opportunity to earn a flag in specific areas, maybe because they didn't have, and that would be because they didn't have enough students in those areas. In some of our schools, um, a subgroup was added this year, and so we'll see flags reported for those subgroups next year. Um, for example, I don't want to take anything out of Ms. Baldwin's presentation, but they added the English language learner subgroup this year. So we'll see flags for those students next year. So they've not had enough 15 students to make that subgroup. They met that threshold this year, and so this, they'll have targets for next year. Yeah. One of the things, too, Dr. Marchman, I'm and this is not an excuse. I, th I think this is um, an issue with the metric itself. Mm -hmm. um, but one student may ding uh, a category three, four, or five times. Wow. Especially um, when you're talking about 15 being a minimum number. Yes, so, I mean, that's, that's part of what we have mm -hmm. to take into consideration. Right. Um, and I would encourage you to go um, to the Godot website and look up the CCRPI reports. You'll see those same flags for graduation rate at our high school levels, um, though they're not reported for CCRPI purposes, or they, though they don't count towards CCRPI, we still report those subgroups for graduation um, at the high school level. Okay. Any other questions about that before we pull up the next one? All right, K number four. All right, so this is a comparison of our 2018 and 2019 scores. And the um, change that the schools increased or decreased from 2019, from 2018 to 2019. Um, you can see that there. You see that we had several schools that had significant jumps, um, a couple of schools that had a little bit of a drop. And then, K, if you'll scroll to the bottom, you'll see the average um, of all of our schools or our system score in 2018 was an 87 and 3 tenths, and in 2019 it was an 89 and a half, and so that was an increase of 2 and 2 tenths. And the state actually and the state declined. decreased, right, 7 tenths. K number <coughs> 6. All right, so um, at the beginning of the presentation, I talked about the weighted achievement rate or the content mastery and how that has stayed the same since CCRPI started being reported. And so what this document is would be a, um, a look at each of those weighted achievement rates for our elementary grades, our middle grades, and our high school grades. And you can see significant improvements from 2015 to 2019 in all of our subject areas and all of our um, our averages at each of those levels. Yes, Brennan, sir. I got to ask you about physical science. I saw it pop up. Am I right to assume that we've uh, turned the corner on that? Or well, it yes, um, it's gone up significantly. You can see we had a slight drop from 2018 in the sure. weighted achievement rate. Um, and so, but yes, we've made tremendous strides since that first year in physical science, absolutely. Um, and then Kay, if you'll scroll down to the graphs. What I've done here is taken each for you and um, just graphed it so you can see the trends um, overall for each of our levels, elementary, middle, and then high school. So I think this speaks volumes since it's, it is the one metric that has stayed consistent. I think this speaks volumes about the good work that's going on in our schools. Um, and I, you know, if, as we continue, if CCRPI stays the same, you've probably read that the governor and our um, state school superintendent is, they're looking at tweaking again. So um, I don't know what, before, what will happen with next year's CCRPI score, but there has been some talk about that. Um, but this one metric is comparable. Yes. Ryan, would it be possible to get, and maybe you do this internally with Dr. Turner and others, but your insight into the data? Because I'm looking at the chart and reading the changes, and in general, it's extremely good. Mm -hmm. And even the declines, like you said, were minor while the bumps up. For instance, Oak Grove was dramatic. Um, so it's, it's great, but I don't, 
I don't know, a fraction of what you know about interpreting the data. And I'd love your, just your insight into, hey, maybe where, what are our, I don't want to say problem areas, our opportunities to improve, if you will, and where are we really just crushing it, you know, that, that we should be really proud. I, I don't want to miss it because I don't understand the data, and I think maybe adding to this summary data maybe some, like, executive key point takeaways that we could we could look and talk about. Uh, I mean, when, when I looked at it, it was extremely positive. However, I'd love your opinion. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. No, yeah, thanks. we can meet together and... Our scores for ELA um, generally trended upward significantly uh, for the district for, uh, and pretty much at every school. Uh, math was a little up and down depending on the school, so we know that we need to put a lot of focus into ELA and literacy, so now we've got to get that laser-like focus on math while sustaining that for, um, for the ELA. Um, science and social studies at the elementary level, those scores are not as strong as we would like, um, in part because I think we've dedicated so much time to ELA, it kind of squeezes out the time for science and social studies. So what we're doing there is um, trying to see how we can embed more science and social studies content into the ELA, into the math, and make it a little bit more integrated. So those are just some general insights off the cuff on no, that. That's great. Thanks, Dr. Yeah. I appreciate it. I'd also like to add to that. I Our progress scores are really strong. Um, when you look at where we compare around the state, we are making, um, I, I think that's probably the thing that we can celebrate the most. It because And the reason for that is because it doesn't matter where you live, what your zip code is, strong teachers are gonna move those kids in a positive direction. And when you look at our progress scores overall in, um, all, in all of our schools, they're very, very high. And I think that's a real strength. Our access scores for the um, readiness indicator, our progress on those, that we're in good shape in there too. So we're moving those kids that come to us speaking another language in a positive direction. And ultimately what you're gonna see as a result of that is an increase in content mastery scores because those students have a better grasp of the language. They're better writers, they're better speakers. And so that transfers into science and social studies mostly, um, as well as English language arts. And then um, you'll see, I think you'll see the graduation rate for that subgroup increase as well because students are, they have a better grasp of the content, they're completing more credits and able to graduate on time. So I think um, that area, the progress area, is an area of strength for this system. So, so the progress is the student's improvement against himself or against <coughs> other students with against the same score? Other students with the same score, yes. And 100 is the maximum for progress, even um, if you went it's over? It's the first percentile to the 99th percentile, so a okay. student, um, is ranked from the first percentile to the 99th percentile. Now, we do cap it at 100 for CCRPI purposes, um, but several of our schools have scores higher than 100% um, in that area. And that's because you can get the point and a half for students who are in that level four um, for and, progress. And the, the story the behind the increase in progress, last year was our first time to see the new graphics and to get those closing the gap flags. So a lot of schools, and it was the first year that we were com that schools were competing against our own scores instead of competing against the state average. Mm -hmm. That was the significant change in the redesign. So last year, schools saw those flags. I think it caught some schools off guard. They may have not been um, as data driven about their subgroups, and so that got everybody's attention. I always refer to it as the cast iron skillet came upside folks' head. Um, and, but subgroup data was more closely followed. Tar instruction became more targeted and therefore you saw increases in growth from so, the previous year. So we make changes at all the levels based on subgroup data? I would say, I would say that all in schools general. became more data driven and more targeted in their instruction to support subgroups. <coughs> so say for example, if you got red flags for Hispanic students, then schools began to have more of a laser-like focus on the progress of their Hispanic students throughout the year. And so what we've seen is an increase in progress this year. So kudos to the schools for that. They, they really were very reflective about their um, previous year's CCRPI 
and took action and made some significant gains. Is it possible for us to see the subgroup data, or is it? I don't think I saw it. Is it in there? And it's it's um, just website. calculated by fly count on there. But yes, if you go to the CCRPI we'll website, you'll be able to look exactly at that. Cool. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. oh, One you. of the other things I, I feel like we need to mention too, because we had such a good bump up with our ELA. I think this is our third year with the new adoption. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you change curriculum, our teachers had to go through professional learning and development. It's taken a little while to get their arms around that, but I think they're beginning to master that. And I think that's another uh, really strong reason for us to begin to see the, the progress there, and hopefully that's going to be a continued trend. Mm -hmm. Roy, Leonard. And then Kay, um, if you'll pull, I'm sorry, Dr. Barrow. No, go okay. for uh, Number seven. <clears throat> and Amy, come on up. Um, yes, that's it, Kay. So um, this is, well, I'll let Amy talk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to steal her thunder. Oh, this is a joint effort. Um, just as our schools have made progress with the academic achievement, our schools have also made um, progress in the school climate. And so we know that school climate is a critical element for student success. Um, and if you take a look at the progression of the school climate scores from 2014 to 2019, we have um, made a significant, we've made significant progress. Um, in 2014, we had um, 10 three-star schools, 11 four-star schools, and three five-star schools. We currently have 22 five-star schools and two four-star schools. And that is attributed to the hard work of our administrators, our staff, parents, students, um, to make this happen in school climate. That, that deserves a woo-hoo. It that does strong, deserve a woo-hoo. That's a lot of hard work Absolutely. for all of our schools. Absolutely. Hey, I got a question about that. Okay. Um, I'm looking at a slide from know, a few slides ago, and it says that the just having PBIS at a school, just saying we have that program at a school, adds 5%. To the it, score? Five points, yes, five sir. It does right? add five points for schools that are implementing with fidelity. So right. with those implementing the 10 critical elements of PBIS. And so I was just wondering is if our score from 2018 to 2019 is mostly attributable to us implementing the, starting those programs at the schools? I, there is, you'll see a progression over time. If you look at as the schools implemented, you will see that many of them went from a, a lower score to a higher score and that those five points could be a part of that but it's also the practices that are implemented as well and attention to um, especially the surveys because our PBIS coaches and our administrators and staff look at those surveys and then implement change within their building based on those student and uh, teacher and parent surveys and we receive we receive um, a data file that has each question that students are asked and parents are asked and the staff is asked and how those students parents and staff responded not an individual child or an individual parent or a teacher but um, just in general and so we're able to provide that data to our schools and they're able to look at that and make changes um, in their climate and culture based on the feedback that they receive and so a great um, a really high number of our schools get that data every year and are able to dig into that. So um, while the five bonus points does certainly help, um, I'm, you're not going to just see the increases that we've had based on those five points. Right. If you can help me understand a couple more things, just because I want to understand what the great job you're doing. <laughs> um, I understand the surveys and how you capture that and understand that you get the five bonus points, understand attendance. but. How do you measure discipline and the safe and substance-free learning environment? How do you, how, where's that number come from? Okay. All right, so the discipline is based on the information that's in Infinite Campus that's, that um, principals and assistant principals record as a part of a student's discipline record. So every time there's an incident, um, that information is put into Infinite Campus and then the state pulls that data. And so at the elementary school, it's simply based on um, the categories are bullying, 
drugs and alcohol and uh, threats, okay? At the middle and high school, it's based on those three categories, plus how students responded to questions like that on the survey. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at a combination of those types of behavior incidents plus the student's response on the surveys to get those um, numbers. When you say the state pulls the data, or is that data redacted or do they know which students are? No, they don't know which students. Okay. That's, um, yeah, that's simply reported at the aggregate level for each school. Thanks. Yeah. And then the, um, oh, I'm sorry, I did address both of those. Mm -hmm. the, the discipline is what's in Infinite Campus, the safe and substance-free learning environment is partly what's in Infinite Campus and then what's in, um, what's reported through the surveys. Have you guys noticed that with PBIS, perhaps things that used to get reported aren't reported anymore? You know what I mean? Like with the change in the way maybe an administrator might govern something that Johnny's on his cell phone, you know, last year it's a write up, this year it's, hey, put your phone away. Come on, let's focus. You know what I mean? Is it possible that some of that is just there managerial style changes? As a, as a part of PBIS, there's what we call teacher managed and office managed. So there is a, a more defined process when a student has an offense that would be teacher managed or office managed. But there, and then they would, for of course offenses that um, warrant, they would definitely be an office referral. But those minor offenses are not reported as part of the star climate rating. So students with cell phones or tardies or those types of things, we're talking about major incidents. State um, reportable yeah, incidents. state reportable incidents. Are, are reported in that those discipline numbers and the safe and substance free learning environment numbers. That makes a lot more sense. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I, I would also say that there are uh, a lot of schools and or districts that have fully implemented PBIS, but they're not getting five rankings. It's it really is the fidelity piece that makes a difference. And uh, again, uh, kudos to our uh, administrators, our coaches, our teams at each school level, uh, I, I see the work that they're doing and uh, obviously uh, we're getting strong results because of that. Absolutely. And I also want to um, just give a shout out or highlight the um, not only the teachers and counselors and others who are responsible for this wonderful news on the climate rating, but the custodians, the nurses, absolutely. the cafeteria workers, bus drivers, bus drivers absolutely. you know, the maintenance crews who all have a, a big hand in, in helping the culture of a school. Absolutely. And so some I want to make sure they get, they get thanked. Sorry. Some of the questions on the survey are questions such as my school is clean, you know, those types of things. So mm -hmm. all of that reflects in this survey. That's good. Any other questions, board members? Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Amy. Thank Appreciate you. the good report. Um, Thank you. I'd like to move on to item 3B with uh, safe learning environments. Uh, Ms. Roxanne Owens is going to come up and talk about uh, goal five. This is uh, as part of our model of achievement accountability. And uh, Roxanne, you have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Barron. Good evening. Just want to take a couple of quick minutes about uh, just to talk about what transportation uh, wants to do with the strategic plan and keeping our uh, learning environments safe. As you know, school buses are just an extension of this classroom. And uh, as soon as the student boards our bus, until they get off the bus, either at school or at home, we want to keep them safe. Now, the state of Georgia has some great curriculum that uh, we teach our students, elementary, middle, and high, how to stay safe. But we as a transportation department feel like we need to go a step further. So in order to ensure a safe, supportive learning environment on our school buses, uh, you can see our safety measures, um, but I'm not gonna read all of those. First of all, we wanna get into our elementary schools. We want our bus drivers and our training staff to get in there, excuse me. <laughs> and um, we actually have a professional puppeteer, believe it or not, this is school bus driver. So she's, insured, she's assured us that she's going to get in the schools and along with the state curriculum, going to bring this to life so that our elementary students can learn safety of school buses. Now we're talking about anything from sitting in a seat safely to crossing in front of a school bus safely. So not only will we be having the uh, school bus, the pretend school bus with a puppet show, we'll also have um, drivers come to the schools, 
have all the students come out and board buses, show them exactly what we mean by our curriculum. So that's on the elementary level. Second step is for the middle school students. Middle school students, we really would like to get in schools and have a contest. And um, Kay, will you be so kind as to click one of these? These are a little cheesy, but this, can, this will show you kind of what we want to get in there and talk about and have our middle school students come up with a song or a rap song or poems or Thank you. What do the yellow lights do? But we just feel like middle school students. I mean, really, how can you get a middle school student to really think about school bus safety? And what our goal is, is, is for middle school students to do these rap songs, have a competition, and bring it on down to the elementary level, because that will also help elementary students enjoy knowing about school, safety, uh, school bus safety. So um, that along with already we do the curriculums provided by the DOE, but we want to make sure that we do that in a timely manner. DOE wants us to get that done within 20 days of the first semester of school. And again, the second time, the second semester of school within that first 20 days of the second semester. So our goal is to make sure that we do exactly what is expected of us, plus bring all these other fun things in to catch the attention of our students to make sure that we keep them safe and um, on our school buses as their learning environment. So it's our goal as a transportation department to just make it fun, make it exciting, so that they can learn and know how to be safe on a bus and around a bus. Any questions? Any questions? Yes, sir. Appreciate the good work, Roxanne. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Okay, next on the agenda is our uh, Whitewater High School feeder pattern presentation. I know uh, um, I see Mr. Cole and uh, several of his uh, partners uh, here, and they're going to come down and, and present. I won't introduce them because I know I did that last time, and you guys felt like y'all wanted to do that. So. All right, Dr. Barrow, uh, Cabinet, Board of Education, I want to thank you for uh, listening tonight. Um, I speak for our whitewater feeder pattern in saying we appreciate the opportunity to share our celebrations and successes and our growth opportunities. This is the same team that thought the new guy would be great to start this presentation. <laughs> so. <laughs> I did volunteer. So. Um, the one I, what I wanted to start with today is just a, a really quick video of um, just to highlight our, our feeder pattern. So go ahead and take a look at this real quick. The portrait of a graduate is a collective mindset where we envision and implement the key aspects of what every student needs to build a successful future. In the whitewater feeder pattern, we are committed to understanding and providing the characteristics in our classrooms to grow each student towards proficiency. All right, I know that we always put that emphasis on um, looking at that portrait of a graduate. So in every slide, what we did is we took a little snapshot of each of those six attributes, and we've correlated it to the, um, each of our slides tonight. So you'll see that. So, okay, can you, it's not going forward for me. So, there we go. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start with Sarah Hartminter. Uh, and I wanted to point out to you, um, you see across the bottom, there's the six attributes that all tie into uh, productive citizens. So um, the demographics are up here. We wanted to show, we wanted to start, all of us wanted to start with each of our demographics. The thing I wanted to point out at Sarah Hart Minter, you can see our student population, our students with disabilities, our ELL students, and our economically disadvantaged students. There's a little plus sign next to each of those signs. And you can see that each of those um, indicates that our population is continuing to increase in all those areas. So when we look at our, our CCRPI score, that presents a challenge for Ms. Holland and I, especially when we start looking at data, because those are a trend that we have to continue to contend with when we look at um, closing the gaps in those areas. 
this is something I really wanted to highlight. This is our, um, our student growth over the last four years. And you can see here, uh, like Dr. Turner said and uh, Mr. Butera said, we put a strong emphasis on ELA, and it shows clearly here. Over the last four years, we've increased approximately 20% in the ELA area because we put a, a huge emphasis on that. Uh, the thing I really wanted to point out is if you look at our distinguished level of students, we went from 10% to 30% of our students hitting that distinguished area, which really brings up that content mastery score. On the contrary, <laughs> just like Dr. Turner had said, our math has kind of plateaued over the last four years. You can see there's only been a, a, you know, a steady increase and then a plateau over the last year. But when we look at that distinguished area, you can see even last year we decreased our students from 20% to 10% of our students that were in that distinguished area. So at our last uh, leadership team meeting, we did look at that data and we said there's a need for some math intervention here. So that is one of the goals that we are setting forward and I think the, the biggest area that we're going to look at for this year is looking at that numbers and operations area because that's a, an easy area that you can hit right away to get a little bit of a boost. So that's what we're going to focus on this year. Uh, we did talk a lot about PBIS. You talked about that. This is our second year of implementation at uh, Minter. Uh, we made some minor changes this year with that implementation. The first change that I wanted to put on, uh, put on there is looking at our matrix, which is across the bottom of the screen. It talks about I am respectful, responsible, safe. We added the problem solver piece there. We realized that the respectful, responsible, safe are things that you could teach students, but being a problem solver, that's something that kids need for a lifelong skill. And that's something they're going to continue to use the rest of their life is solving problems. So we thought that would be a great one to add. The other piece that we really wanted to focus on is we didn't, because we've been a leader in me uh, school and it's been established at Mentor, we didn't want to take the integrity away from that. So. Mr. Falkenhagen and I spent a good portion of the beginning of the school year uh, integrating PBIS with the Leader and Me program, and we created the first eight days of school cool tool lessons based on the integration of the Leader and Me and the PBIS program. And it, and it went off really well without a hitch. We kind of talked about the four expectations along with the Leader Pledge, and everything is geared towards I am a leader when I am respectful, responsible, safe problem solver. So we want to put that ownership of the leadership on the students as well. The next m minor change we made is we introduced a, a leader loot, which is the individual um, recognition of students. We did look at the student survey, and, and one of the lowest areas we found was that students didn't feel like they were recognized for their behavior. So that was kind of a trigger to us. Last year, we used uh, lead cards, which recognized classes. So if classes were following the expectations in the hallway or they were following the Leader in Me program, they'd get a lead card and it was celebrated as a class. This year, when students are following those four expectations, they get leader loot and they can turn those in. And that takes us to that last category, which is the student celebration. So the student celebrations we do on a quarterly basis. We had our first one on Halloween. We did a thrilling Thursday, we called it. And it was a Halloween scavenger hunt. Uh, one thing I'm really proud about for this is we asked for parent volunteers, and we had 100 parent volunteers show up on Thursday. Um, it, it was a little dicey there with the weather, <laughs> but we did make it outside for a good portion of the day, and um, we did have a ton of parents come up that were very complimentary, and I even heard some kids in the hallway say, no, this is the best Halloween ever. So those PBIS celebrations are something that I know the kids are going to look forward to. This here is a little snapshot of what our school is uh, celebrating. And you can see how excited those kids are when they ha have that green cash in their hands. That's the leader loot that they have. Um, and they, they can turn those in for rewards, not only just our PBIS celebrations. The teachers have created celebrations in their classroom that are um, really non-monetary things. They're not buying us from a school store, but they're turning it into um, like have technology day or sit in the teacher's chair for the day. We even had some kids that they can do a class celebration. And we've had kids that have turned in their entire thing for the entire class. So instead of having each kid turn in three, they're saying, I'm going to turn in 25 for the whole class to have an extra recess. So we're seeing some great success with that. If you look at the third picture from the right on the top, that is our thr thrilling Thursday. That was our from our PBIS celebration. 
We also wanted to talk a little bit about that leader in me. We continue to focus on that. So once a month, we look at um, having a habit showcase to look at those winners and provide some celebration for those kids that are following those seven habits of highly effective students. Uh, a couple of things that we talk about for literacy is fifth grade came up with a, a, a program called Starbucks based on Starbucks. And every, once, every, every week, they have a guest speaker come in dressed um, uh, like the character from the book that they're starting. And they get dressed up in their Starbucks outfits and they serve coffee and not coffee. They serve like it's just special treats for the kids and it's really fun for the kids. They get into it. Last week I was Al Capone, so I got to come in and, and read as Al Capone. And then the last picture we wanted to show, I wanted to highlight this. Um, that's from our booster thon. We had raised a certain amount of money and we had meet, meet our, we had met our goal and we still had one week left and I told the kids if we raised another $5,000 from that, I would get on top of the roof and sing karaoke. So there I am on top of the roof. We unfortunately don't have a video clip, but um, Steve heard it from his school, so he said I did okay. So I was pretty proud of that. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, this is our fourth year of doing the SEEKS program, and this ties, SEEKS ties right in along with our social emotional learning. It ties in with PBIS and ties in with Leader and Me. And the great thing about the SEEKS program is that um, I know along with Cindy, um, uh, Aaron had created POGS, these peer observation groups, where teachers are allowed to go into classrooms, observe teachers, and present positive feedback to them about how they're engaging students. And I was fortunate enough to sit in on a group that had five or six teachers that had observed each other. And the conversation was phenomenal. Not only was it building kids up, or building teachers up um, in a positive way, it was adult PBIS. But teachers were learning from each other, and they were like, that's a great idea. I'm going to steal that back from my class. So the SEEKS program is a great opportunity for the students, or the teachers, to be able to access that to engage the students. And then the last thing I want to talk about is STEAM. This is our third year of um, STEAM initiative. I have really buy into the STEAM piece. You could see that attribute there is creating those problem solvers. When we do STEAM, this allows kids the opportunity to, to learn those soft skills, collaboration, problem solving, working together. These are skills that they're going to develop at, during a, an entire lifetime. They're going to need these skills to use for an entire lifetime. Sometimes we don't get to do that in, an, in a non-traditional classroom or a traditional classroom setting. They don't get to participate in some of those. So we do want to continue that STEAM initiative to continue practicing those soft skills. So at this point, I'm going to ask Dr. Robert, uh, Lewis to come up and um, go on ahead with Inman. So Dr. Robinson, thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Good evening. I have uh, Ms. Judy, um, Ashley Judy with me, the assistant principal at Inman Elementary, and thank you for this opportunity. As you can see, following this same format, um, we have our student demographics in front of you. Uh, probably one of the highlights for us is um, in the Earlier part of the year, Dr. Barrow and Ms. Heron, uh, and I'm sure some others were involved in this decision, we added an additional pre-K class at Edmond Elementary, uh, which gave us an opportunity to um, welcome 22 energetic, bright-eyed four-year-olds. Uh, now we've got a total of 44 that we're addressing, and I think that's um, been one of the great um, addition to Inman this year, so sir, thank you for that. We get an opportunity again to get them school ready. Um, you can see our CRPI score. For me, this reminds me of realities and, and possibilities. We have a lot of uh, opportunities to uh, dig deep into our school data and work uh, together collaboratively. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, briefly, but very proud of our school climate um, uh, rating. We, um, we try to get along on a daily basis at Inman and have a lot of fun. And uh, our climate is, is uh, tremendous in that we try to build relationships, lasting relationships um, with our students and with our uh, adult peers. And so we have a lot of fun. The readiness score is, is certainly up, and we are uh, really uh, striving to continue to keep that area moving forward. On this screen, we can celebrate a little bit with uh, ELA and, and math as we continue to um, realize as we look at the data, it suggests that our students are learning what they're being taught. Our teachers are, are really focused on um, best practices as we continue to learn and grow even as a professional staff. One of the highlights of this, uh, we don't have it uh, on, on the screen, but our ELA, 
our students with disabilities and our economically disadvantaged students gained six points this particular school year. And so we're really proud of that. Um, our focus has been, and as others have been stated, uh, on the ELA, which and we've seen growth, and you can see that over the years. We really focused on that. Now, the, po the possibility for us now is to really focus on math and science. And um, we're, we're going to do that as we continue to close that gap. And um, we have quite a few um, support, uh, engage with our uh, teaching staff to help, um, again, look at data. In fact, in the morning, Mr. Butera will be at our school and our leadership team, we're going to come together and dig deep into this data and look for opportunities, not only for our staff to grow on a professional level, but look for those areas um, that we can certainly address uh, and make sure that math and science is being taught at, at the most um, advantageous level when it comes to tier one instruction. Um, we've got instructional content coaches that will be involved in our meeting. Yes. Can you get back the last graph? I'm not sure what that's a percentage of. This, this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I thought at first I thought it was the same data that uh, from Mentor, but I, I think it's. What is this, that? This is our ELA and, and math performance. Let me see if I can get my notes up. But this is for ELA and math and uh, content mastery. Our students um, have demonstrated some growth in this area. So proficient and distinguished learners. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Thanks. This is, and no, this is not distinguished learners. This is the, all of our students. This is all of our students, because we've been focused on ELA, particularly narrative writing, um, over the past four years or so. All right. did, did that answer your question? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. Accumulation. Uh, it just threw me because they, it was the same data presented differently. I'm sorry. The terminology <laughs> is different. I'm okay, sorry about thanks. that. I sorry got about you that. Now. Good question. Thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Dr. Turner. Um, talking about closing the gap in, in progress here, again, this is where our work is going to be uh, focused on this coming school year as we continue again as a team to come together go deep in this data and make sure that we are using best practices to address both math and science, as well as continuing to keep up the, the progress in um, ELA and, and math as well. Um, our little guy in the middle, he says it all. You know, it's all about smiles and, and, and having fun at Inman PBIS. We're in our fifth year. Um, and for us, we haven't, the only change, I really don't call it a change, but it's continual growth for our staff. Our PBIS team, um, we have monthly meetings sometimes, several meetings during the month, to make sure that, number one, our teachers understand the, the uh, PBIS framework better and that we're very clear on our expectations for adults and, and we um, continue to, to grow in that area. Our students are having a lot of fun. We have PBIS, uh, PBIS celebration as well. Um, and we're going to continue that, that process because it makes a difference when our students know that they're cared for, they're loved, and the expectations to be ready, to be respectful, and be responsible, no matter where they are, on the bus, on the playground, that's very important. And so we have a lot of fun with, with PBIS. We have a source store. They can earn PBI, uh, PBIS bucks, and they go to that store um, uh, pretty frequently and, and uh, enjoy shopping and spending their, their Eagle bucks. STEAM has uh, been a part of Inman. Um, for a number of years, we continue to um, give our teachers opportunity to take ownership of that so that our students, again, can collaborate, problem solve, and continue to be creative through project-based learning. The photo on the right, um, again, speaks volumes in terms of our feeder pattern connection. I am just really thankful for Mr. Cole, uh, uh, Ms. Baldwin, and, and their staff for their support. Um, you see Dr. Davis is up there, and uh, Mr. Patterson is up there. We try to get the community involved, and we've had um, um, a, lot of, a lot of success with that. Our readathon just ended, and I think the total is over $20,000 maybe, with a lot of people involved in that process, and we're very fortunate to have that. I know that um, uh, Mr. Ray Ball had an invitation to come out, and Mr. Pressburg both, so we invite you to all come and be a part of the things that we're doing at Inman. This slide is another. Um, powerful slide again of collaboration and working together as part of um, um, Inman's effort. The, the top photo, EMC Kawita Fayette, approached us um, 
the last spring and offered to come in and do a project um, based on what teachers and students felt would be important. And we got together several committees with teachers um, and the unanimous vote was a maker station. And so that shelf in front of them on that picture was what they built and brought to the school um, and set up and it was a great team effort. Um, we did the asking and they provided the resources for our teachers. And so our students and teachers get to use the maker space quite frequently uh, with STEAM projects and other class related projects. Again, the Whitewater High School, that's Coach Holly and his football team, they come on Fridays and open the doors for our students and parents. And parents love it, students love it. I love it because I don't have to go outside and do car duty every on Fridays. Uh, but it's, it's a great relationship. In fact, uh, Coach Holly coached my son many, many years ago, so it's come kind of full circle. The picture on the far right up top, those are awesome parents who have taken ownership and adopted our um, courtyard. Um, and it's beautiful because these ladies come in there almost on a daily basis, and there's something going on in our courtyard. They've turned it into a learning lab. Classes get to come in and, and look at um, uh, the, the growth process and planning process, so it's a fun place. The photo on the bottom left, or be, be my left, with the flag in the center of it, a parent brought this idea to us um, maybe three years ago. It's called Community Circle. And the first Friday of every month, we bring everyone into the gym, and uh, it's a great time to for shout outs. Uh, a school mission uh, is, is chanted out. We've had the Whitewater Band, the, the cheerleaders have been over. We've recognized um, community members, first responders, and it's student, it's all student led. Uh, and it's a great time, great feeling for us um, um, at Inman. At, uh, the middle slide, Watchdog again, was uh, another parent idea, and uh, we embraced that about two years ago. So we've got dads coming, and most of the time they spend the entire day supporting students in whatever capacity um, the teacher needs. And, and that's been a very great addition to see more males in the schools and, and being involved. Big plus. And it is all about community engagement. The last slide you'll see. Um, the the video on the left shows our teachers engage in PLC. And actually, that first uh, clip was our parapros. One of the things that we wanted to do this year was to provide uh, continuous professional growth for our instructional support, because they are the unsung heroes in our building. They do so much. Um, they don't complain. Uh, at least I don't hear it, you know. And they come, and they work hard, and they wanted to learn. So our instructional coach and our RTI teacher leaders leading that. What you're seeing now are our teachers engaged in a uh, writing PLC. Again, that's been our focus over the last three or four years, and we continue to make that the a focus. Now, our effort, again, towards science and math um, will con 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 we'll continue to make that a focus as well. This is also our first year with SEEKS, and I can't say enough about it. I, I wish every teacher uh, can experience going through this process. We're in the initial stage. We have six teachers that are represented. Um, they're being coached by Dr. Emily Rubin and supported by our exceptional children's staff, and uh, they're having a ball. Uh, every session that I've gone to and witnessed myself, our teachers are bonding, those six. They will become mentors for other teachers in the building as we go through this process. So this has been a great addition for Inman Elementary, and we look forward to continual growth and making sure that all of our little ones get what they need. We thank you for your support. Did I miss anything? You got it. I got it, all right, good. Good evening, everyone. I know that we have a slide at the end, but I also want to take the opportunity to say thank you for your support and for providing the Media Center refurbished for us. Um, we have a picture at the end if you haven't had a chance to see that, but uh, we really appreciate that. Am I doing this? Okay. Okay, our first slide um, shows the demographics at Whitewater Middle School. Uh, so our student population currently is 918. Uh, our sixth grade is our largest group of students. Uh, we feel like that group gets larger every day, closer to uh, any holiday breaks coming up. Um, we currently have 144 students uh, in our special education program and 60 students who um, have a 504. And um, our uh, economically disadvantaged population um, has uh, risen just a little bit to uh, a little over 25%. 
Our school climate is uh, something that I um, felt strongly about going to Whitewater some time back, and I am very proud to say that I feel like we are in a great position. Um, that is a priority of mine. Um, and when I arrived at Whitewater, uh, I had a, a handful of parents that were concerned about that. So I, I may have mentioned this last time, but I still think that this is the crowning uh, glory to that. Uh, a student had transferred in and before lunch came back to the counselor and said, you know, I just love this school because a kid can just be a kid and I already see that. And that's really the way I want everybody to feel about Whitewater Middle School. So we're proud of our climate rating. Um, our progress score um, has gone up uh, to 97.4, so um, that was significant for us, and we were very proud to see that um, rise. Um, once again, I'm looking at the data just a little bit differently. When we first were scheduled to um, present earlier, uh, our data had not all been released, and so I had uh, spoken with Mr. Butera about um, this particular slide that comes from the SLDS, uh, the state, um, statewide longitudinal data system. This is the Georgia student growth model, and growth is really my focus. Uh, I think it's important to see where a student is and where that student goes. Um, I also find it interesting being a hardcore middle school person to see the difference in the developmental stages of a sixth grader versus an eighth grader. Uh, very, very um, big differences between the developmental brain of a sixth grader going from concrete thinking to more abstract thinking. So ELA um, is uh, on the left hand side and then math of course is on the right but going from sixth grade to seventh to eighth and by the time the students leave I feel really confident about that math is a concern and so I find that uh, interesting Dr. Turner that you brought that up we still want to look at that because that's an area that I feel like should be stronger um, and can be and I want that to to be an area that we need to work on yes sir do you mean math in terms of content mastery? Because your growth looks the growth you know, continued is, success. It right? is. We we just see a difference between a fifth grade score and a sixth grade score. We've been very transparent in our our conversations about that. Uh, I've been uh, in conversations with Dr. Barrow about that. I've seen that over the years. I'm not sure if there's uh, something different about the test or something that we're doing that we need to do differently. Uh, I've spoken uh, with uh, Deb Troutman, our math coordinator, about that as well. So um, I would just like to continue to dig into that and see um, if there's something else that we need to, to look at that I haven't thought about. The next slide um, is a vision um, idea for us. Um, the healthcare profession, the career path at Whitewater High School is tremendous. Uh, many, many students participate in that. Um, and in my home, um, my child was very much enthusiastic about that. Um, I think that's an area that I would like to see the middle school uh, look into for one class or at least two classes, uh, or at least one, but maybe two, um, where we might start a healthcare pilot for students who are potentially interested in health care before they get to the high school and let that be um, just for the eighth grade and just for two classes and then potentially you know uh, that person could finish at the high school or whatever uh, however that would work but we've begun um, conversations about that and I feel strongly about that the desire is there and I think it would be a special honor for the eighth grade to, to have that special class. So we're talking about that. The next slide uh, shows our PBIS pep rally. And the actual video gets kind of wild and crazy. Uh, Ms. Henley got to come out for some of that. Uh, the students uh, have relays. Uh, this is eighth grade. We don't let the sixth graders do this, but the eighth graders, uh, as well as the teachers, it is a phenomenal time for bonding. Um, we see students 
uh, get together with students that they may not have had any kind of relationship with. Uh, and we always have this early in the school year so that they can start those relationships and those friendships early and um, really just make that team um, have ownership to the students. The very cool thing is to see the teachers um, with the students, and they get to see their teachers in a whole different light, and um, it really takes down a lot of those barriers, and um, it's, it's just the coolest thing. We watch it all day long, and every grade level has a different program. So the slide on the right, or the picture on the right, shows um, the sixth graders because they're learning um, the different uh, areas that we focus on, which of course are safety, respect, and responsibility. And then we have our newsletter at the bottom. Um, the PBIS team meets uh, once a month, and we have Swiss data, which is sort of like information that's coming from Infinite Campus, but it's more detailed and refined. And it tells us um, what time of the day, what day of the week, the different offenses, so that we can hone in on those um, concerns and make them better and um, so the PBIS meeting is is very worthwhile and that Swiss data too so on the newsletter that goes out once a month we look at those um, different areas in that data and um, try to improve that okay um, Whitewater Middle School does not have the STEAM program but we have tried to focus in on a STEM class in our connections time, uh, looking at um, project-based learning. The students, um, in collaboration with the uh, technology robotics class and math classes, uh, just recently made um, the cornhole um, games and ended up um, getting a lot of support um, from parents uh, that came in and, and donated their time and finances and then ended up giving those to each of the academic teams to use as uh, Fun Friday activities for rewards uh, through PPIS. Also, we try to um, connect the dots uh, and want to continue to improve that STEM approach with interdisciplinary classes, not only the connection classes, but the academics. So it's sort of um, threefold there. And all of this also leading to career readiness. This is our fourth year of SEEKS, and uh, to my knowledge, unless uh, I have missed something, we're the only middle school that is involved in SEEKS. Uh, when we first heard Emily Rubin, I followed her out and stalked her uh, as she was waiting to um, get ready to get on a plane. I very much believe that PBIS and SEEKS um, go hand in hand in supporting the students in a social emotional engagement um, way uh, to create social uh, wellness, um, emotional wellness. It incorporates knowledge and skills and it looks at what we're doing in the classroom, teaching our standards, but the way that we're teaching them, how we're going about it to pull the students in. So we had an initial team of about eight people. Uh, we've tried to add additional people as time goes on. It doesn't fit exactly the same way it does um, as the elementary school does. So our challenge has been to sustain and to uh, spread out um, our teacher mentors and to make observations of what's going on in those classrooms to um, have those as examples to demonstrate to spread the SEEKS process. <coughs> Excuse me. The last thing that um, f feeds into the social emotional wellness, and we started this uh, back in the summer, we received a $5,000 grant from the Department of Ed to begin Sources of Strength, um, which is a program that we're looking at beginning in January. So it looks at, I believe there are eight sources of strength, and it teaches the children um, which source of strength they go to under whatever circumstances. If it's, um, <coughs> bless you. If it happens to be grief um, or depression or whatever that area is, um, the premise of it is to look for those sources. 
So in closing, uh, for White Water Middle, we want to increase our STEM class to include more interdisciplinary involvement, to strengthen the social emotional wellness um, through six PBIS and sources of strength. Uh, and the biggest part for the academic area is closing the gap. So we um, have spoken with a handful of people that we want to really sit down and look at that um, area to discern specifically we can see who we're talking about, but how we can best meet their needs because our subgroups are changing. Um, we are noticing more families that are in um, transition, and um, we need to look at what we can do for them coming in our door to um, increase that um, academic success. And then lastly, of course, the health science class, if we can somehow pull that off and, and offer that to our students. Thank you. Thank you. So obviously, we got a lot of great things going on at the lower levels coming up to the high school level, and our job is made a lot easier because of the great work they're doing below us. So I commend uh, Lewis and uh, everybody else going that's doing everything, all the great things at the elementary school, the middle school, uh, providing great students for us when they get to the high school. So just like tonight, it's my job to put a bow on it by the time they get there and, uh, and send them off into the real world, whatever it is, their chosen endeavor. So, um, Obviously, again, just like everybody else has done, we have our demographic data up there. And the two things I just want to point out is the focus that we have on students with disabilities and our economically disadvantaged population. And the reason I like to focus on those two areas because those two parts of the demographics know no racial bounds, they know no gender discrimination. Um, students in all areas uh, have issues with, with disabilities. Uh, whether it's economically disadvantaged in situations they find themselves in. And so if we address issues at those levels of, of the demographics, we can take care of a lot of our problems in, if we focus on the right things related to those students. Um, we're obviously very excited about that CCRPI score of a 90. Uh, we reached that a, plat, plat, uh, that a mark that we were striving for, so we went from that B-plus to the A-minus. Just like the proud student coming home with that report card, we are smiling, so we're happy about that. Um, our five-star our five star climate rating, uh, again, just speaks to the, the pleasure that students and parents have about coming to Whitewater High School. Um, and obviously, uh, we're wanna, we want to make sure everybody feels welcome and accepted when they come into our school, the students feel safe and have a, a safe and, and adequate learning environment for them. One of the areas that we chose to point out tonight, and there's a lot of areas of, of academic achievement, celebrations we could have, but unfortunately for the time, we wanted to make sure we focused on a few of the right things to point out to you. But obviously, uh, just like Dr. Turner said earlier, when the scores came out last year, the red flags and the closing the gap area hit us really hard. We saw a lot of the red flags that we had, and it, it kind of, it, it, you know, kind of hit us in the pride area because we take a lot of pride in making sure that we provide a viable, uh, accessible uh, academic curriculum that's challenging and rigorous for all students, not just one group of students. And to, so to see those red flags last year really, really hit us hard. And we went to work on that. We decided that we were going to make closing gaps our primary focus. And as you can see by the data coming up 24.3 points from where we were, we went to work on it and we got it done. Uh, just so you have some highlights on what, what we feel like with the biggest attributors there. Um, we focused a lot on our PLC programs, our PLC uh, process in our school building. We made those, those PLC, those professional learning communities for our teachers, more focused and structured on data. Uh, common assessments became the expectation as opposed to just an option. And the reason it became an expectation is because we knew that if we did not start getting our teachers to look at assessment data across the board, in a commonality that we were not looking at the right things in terms of what the kids needed to achieve. It basically came down to a mindset of making our teachers understand that it's not about your kids in your classroom, it's about our kids in our school building. And because we started changing that mindset and that focus, I believe it started getting a lot of our teachers on the, on the, uh, on the right train in terms of saying this is what we need to be looking at in terms of processes that we have in the classroom different strategies we have in the classroom, and just teachers having that conversation about, hey, what are you doing that's getting your kids the results you're getting? And having that, that collaboration there. And we did that collaboration not only horizontally across the board, 
we did that collaboration <coughs> vertically among, uh, among the teachers in the building as well as teachers from the high school down to the middle school. So it's, it's important to go all the way up through there and see how we're connecting the dots along the way. Um, again, when we talk about the, the, the collaboration and the piece of professional learning communities, our leadership team went to work really hard on John Hattie's research. And if you don't know what John Hattie's research tells you, it tells you a lot about what's effective for students. And the biggest thing that is the most effective thing according his, to his research is collective efficacy across the board. The, the fact that teachers believe they can, they can move the targets. It's all about what they do with those students in those classrooms and having that power to believe that they can achieve if they put their mind to it. So we did a book study with that with our leadership team and I'm proud to say that a lot of our leaders, leaders within departments are going back and doing that book study within their departments this year. So they're, they're really jumping on board with that collective efficacy, efficacy piece of what we're doing. Uh, celebrating the success of our graduation rate is huge. Um, we've, we have been very happy that we've continued to carry the torch in terms of graduation rates. Uh, this year we're sitting at 94.5%. We haven't really dropped down below 93% in the last three to four years. Um, our biggest, uh, biggest thing about that is, and the one thing we are really proud is our students with disabilities, again, going just back to that population, we hold a 91.6% graduates, 91.67% graduation rate for those students in the five-year category. And we talk to our students and our parents about, if you can't get it done in four, we're gonna get it done in five, okay? Because the point of it is, is to get you a diploma so you can go out and be successful. So 91.67% of our, of our students with disabilities are walking out at least in five years with a diploma. Um, our component, our readiness component, again, was on the rise. Accelerated enrollment is up because we push a lot of the dual enrollment pathways, uh, or excuse me, uh, our AP programs and our dual enrollment. And then we also look at everything we've got going on in, in terms of our pathway completion, our end of pathway assessments, and making sure that kids are staying on track with pathways. I give a lot of credit to our counselors and the job they do through the advisement program and talking to students about pathways and the importance of having that pathway completion. Um, college and career readiness, again, looking at the fact that our students are going off ready to be in college or whatever it is they're wanting to do, but college and career readiness, um, looking at the students who don't need remediation when they get there, who have had successful scores on ACT and SAT programs and our AP scores. So those are some great things we're celebrating and we're we'll continue to push those numbers up as we really focus on what we got going on in the readiness component. Um, wanted to point out, just like the other schools, we have our third, we are in our third year of PBIS, and this is our uh, slogan up there, as you can see, it's our hashtag of WHS Rare Breed, uh, Rare being responsible, accountable, respectful, and engaged. Part of the third year program is pushing this out to the students and getting them on board with the vernacular of what's going on and what it means to be rare at Whitewater High School. Um, so we are actually sitting down as a team and we're looking at our data as well. We're, behaviors are occurring and we're looking at how we can celebrate the great things the students are doing. Uh, we're getting, trying to get some of these ideas from the elementary schools. Believe it or not, the students at the high school are still little kids on the inside and they love some celebration too. So we're trying to figure out how we can make it more, uh, and more exciting for them as well as we look for, um, for those opportunities. Couldn't let it go without making sure I give my shout out to my STEM kids. You all have heard from them and you've all seen the great work they're doing with the STEM bus. And uh, they actually had the bus down at the technology competition this past weekend. So this was last year's group, a photo of last year's. We have this year's cohort that's actually finishing up their science fair project. So as soon as they're done with those science fair projects, they're ready to get full loaded work on that, that STEM bus. So, but they're doing great work, and again, that program has really taken off and been a success and something we could brag about, not only at Whitewater High School, but in the, in the Fayette County school system itself. Uh, looking at our areas of growth, just a few things we want to work on. Um, our literacy component was not quite where I wanted it to be. Uh, we're still showing some progress there, but in terms of looking at literacy in the element of content vocabulary and discipline vocabulary, We've got, still got to make sure our students are proficient in both of those areas. I think a lot of times we, we feel like high school students don't need the content vocabulary anymore as much as they do disciplinary vocabulary, and, and that's not necessarily true. We've got to continue to work on that and make sure our students understand content vocabulary, the process of reading, as well as start integrating the disciplinary vocabulary there. So we're going to continue to work on that, 
and our progress component, we put a lot of emphasis on our closing gaps this year. Our progress component, which is the student growth element, which is only judged in math and English, um, it took a little bit of a hit, not terrible, but it did take a little bit of a hit. But that's just going to come through our conversations of helping teachers understand that you can't focus on closing the gaps without keeping the focus also on rigorous instruction in the classroom and making sure you're still pushing students to achieve at higher levels. Social emotional support is always going to be there in terms of, of our students and the things they're going through. Um, you know, I've, we've seen a rapid increase of student anxiety. Uh, that is becoming a real reality in terms of students just suffering from anxiety issues. Um, that, I think a lot of that, again, just philosophically has to do with, uh, with society and the way things work today and social media. Um, but we can't make changes there. We can try to provo provide all the support we can for those students. And even with Ms. Baldwin talking about the Sources of Strength program and she, her students are going to be coming in, that, in with that in January, that may be something we start rolling up into the high school to help our students in those areas as well. And I couldn't let it go without talking about our formative instructional practices that we're doing. Uh, that's a model through the Georgia Department of Education. We have those monthly, ever bi-monthly actually, our teachers go in and they actually do modules on formative instructional practices. They go in and they look at learning targets and what it means for students to meet learning targets. How do they know when students meet learning targets? How do the students know when they meet them? Because that's the biggest thing is getting students to take the ownership of their learning. And so we're looking at all of those things. What does it mean to look at different types of assessments? And, uh, and what, does, what do assessments truly tell you? How are you designing your assessments to get the, the actual uh, data you're looking for in terms of student growth and student potential? Again, just piggybacking on that, we've got our formative instructional practices going on. We're always working on our continual professional learning. Just a little snapshot of some of the most recent things we did where we actually got teachers engaged in looking at the assessment process. So this will all go in and help not only build our, our students' success and not only improve our scores, but again, just the good work of making sure all of our students are getting access to that viable curriculum. Wouldn't, wouldn't, we couldn't let it pass without making sure you all knew that we are very proud of our media centers and we thank you for the support you, you gave us in allowing us to make these redesigns. Um, you know, the students are excited about this. I know the students at my school have come in and sat down and treated it just like Starbucks without having the coffee in there and spilling it on anything. But they're really excited about having a space that they can utilize that they feel is up to date and just provides them some comfort in, in having a place to go and sit down and read and, uh, and chat with a friend, or whatever it may be. So we thank you for that. Uh, just a video we wanted to show you about our community. So just take this in a I just wanted to take a minute and wrap that up just by showing you the, the, intentional, the intentionality of Mr. Gibbs, Dr. Robinson, Ms. Baldwin. We've all had in making the Whitewater Feeder Pattern a true, a true community, a community about student success, uh, not only academically, uh, but the whole student in the process of growing up from a K through 12 student. And so with that, any questions, we are here to answer. 
Yeah, I got a little distracted during your presentation because I was on Twitter looking at the rare breed <laughs> hashtag. And uh, I'm looking forward to dig digging in that a little deeper. It looks like there's a lot of exciting and interesting things going on at your right. uh, school. And we do, you know, we're trying to take advantage of those social media things, even though some of us are still learning more than others in terms of how, to, how all that works. But that is one of, the, one of the things we all, and I know we all want to emphasize the good things that are going on in our school, and that gives us, that gives us an opportunity to do, to do that and put that out on display. Good for me. Well, I, just, I just love that you're, um, on your professional learning, you're letting the uh, teachers get together and work with other teachers. I think that's very effective, and I know they probably find that um, the most uh, productive of a lot of the professional work, learning that they do. Thank you. Great job. Yeah, anyone else? Yeah. And congratulations on all your progress and your climate scores and, and everything else. It's very exciting to hear about all the great things that are going on in the whitewater feeder pattern. Well, again, thank you for your support, and we really appreciate it. Absolutely. I, I know we Thanks. have all our principals here, but all of our assistant principals, I see you guys out there too. So thank you all very much for coming out tonight. Um, Mr. Hollowell, if you have no objection, I'll move on to the superintendent's report. Um, first uh, item there deals with school nutrition, adult meals. I know there's a memorandum there that uh, Mr. Gray and Ms. Wilder uh, provided for you, but long story short, uh, we have uh, a federal audit that's coming up uh, later this year, and we've been reviewing our per plate cost. Um, we're fine as far as the children uh, lunch costs are concerned, but our adults that eat in the cafeteria, uh, we see we're coming up a little bit short. Uh, on breakfast, that's 25 percent per meal, 25 cents per meal, and lunch is 50 cents per meal. Um, so in order to not get a, a siding on the audit that's coming up, we need to move uh, the breakfast cost uh, per plate to $2.50 and lunch to $4.25. I think, Mr. Gray, I've covered all that, but uh, uh, we'll ask you to officially vote on that at our uh, next board meeting, but I did want to give you the data behind that. We sort of introduced that to you a little bit earlier, but uh, I think we've got all of our information together now, and uh, with uh, your blessings, we'll have that on the next agenda. Any questions there? If not, we uh, want our facility updates. Uh, Mr. Satterfield's here. He's going to uh, quickly go through that with you and bring you up to speed with where we are with our current projects. Good evening. Uh, just a quick update on the projects. Uh, still winding down at Fayette High. Uh, on, as far as the punch list, just about got that project completed, just a few odds and ends. Uh, Lafayette Educational Center, uh, of course, as you well know, we had a ribbing cutting just the other day, which was very successful for here. Uh, we're also working with the architectural firm on uh, the work for technology services. They're working on designing the renovation of, of that space for them. Uh, Oak Grove Elementary uh, walking track was put in over the last couple weeks and getting ready to sod the areas in between that track. Uh, foundation work to begin on the uh, uh, administrative and PE facility that will be started within the week. Uh, we'll start foundation work there. Uh, J.C. Booth, uh, the uh, replacement school, the GMP has been determined for the project and the state DOE uh, last week gave the final approval on the plans. Safety and security upgrades, the contractor is currently working on his punch list and he's down just to a couple of items there. Uh, Sandy Creek Film Lab modification, uh, we've received a CEO. Uh, we're also in the process of helping uh, the school install some of the new equipment that they've ordered for that lab and they're going to have a ribbon cutting in a couple of weeks there. Uh, North Fayette Gym Connector uh, contractors uh, received the CO and is currently working on his last few punch list items. The high school track 
upgrades. Uh, we're completely through at Whitewater High School. At McIntosh, they completed last week the installation of the rubber base, and all they lack is striping the, the track. And they'll hopefully get that in the next week or so, just weather permitting. They have to work around the rain or the wind in, in that case. Uh, but uh, winding down a lot of the projects that we had last summer and fall. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Satterfield? Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. You. Thanks, Mike. Uh, last on the superintendent's report is our attendance and enrollment. Uh, we've uh, taken a look at that, and at the end of the month, our attendance is 20,544 students. Uh, just in looking at that, year to date, that tells us we are uh, increased our student enrollment uh, at 237 students, and um, uh, we appreciate the fact that that number is going in the right direction. So unless the board has any questions about that, yeah, uh, I have one question. Yes, sir. And uh, this is just for future um, attendance reports. Sure. I'd be real interested to uh, know some of our program enrollments. I know you've got your reach and your mainstay, and some of those are probably included in the high school enrollments already. But um, we got our Center of Innovation, the IB programs coming up, um, maybe some of our other programs that the board approves. I'd, um, I'd just be interested to in know what our okay. attendance is in some of the sure. programs. We can uh, we can probably break that down. We'll uh, uh, I'll get back with you and maybe we can identify the ones that you particularly want to see. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that based on the district or is that based on each school? Um, just based on the district. Okay. Just, uh, yeah, Good deal. What are we, uh, okay. What are we getting for our money? <laughs> sure. Sure. How many students are we serving for X Ab dollars? Absolutely, <laughs> we can do that. Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, we'll move to our action item uh, with uh, J.C. Booth Middle School. I uh, would uh, just make this opening comment that the Board of Education has been reviewing the J.C. Booth Middle School facility options really for almost two years. Uh, multiple options have been reviewed, but uh, we had the uh, opportunity to purchase property on Stagecoach Road, and, and once that took place, then we uh, moved to the uh, the options moving down to the two top choices, and uh, that became a, a major renovation at the current site or building a replacement school uh, on the new site. We do have site approval, architectural and engineering designs and bids uh, that have been secured for the Stagecoach site. With the guaranteed maximum price for the actual facility is forty million six hundred fifty-five thousand. Uh, we have to include uh, the architectural and civil engineering and also the energy management uh, part of that. That's just a little over two point eight million, and then also technology, furniture, and other contingencies. That's just over two point five, just under two point six million. Uh, our all-in price would be forty-six million for this particular option. And that is the recommendation before this board this evening. Okay, I need a motion and a second, and then we can have discussion. So, so moved. moved. Second. Okay. Discussion? I know we've kind of talked it all out. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've beat the dead horse pretty bad uh, through our emails, but uh, you know, just as a fiduciary, I'm concerned about the cost, the traffic the need for XX space and the ill will we might cause and that's it that's all yeah. documented i um i just want to uh, take a moment and um thank the board members and dr barrow and the staff for all the due diligence they've done on this issue i know everyone has worked very hard and um we've had a lot of conversations with the community we've talked with each other a, a lot we've um we have looked at it from multiple different angles and i know for my own vote um I'm looking at what I think is in the best interest um, long term for the for the school district and, and what's best for students in the community. And I know the other board members are are considering that as 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 well. But I, I just wanted to take a moment and thank my colleagues for all the hard work we've done because we have been um, studying this issue for several months. Um, I'll go ahead and if there's no other comments. I'll go ahead and call it for a vote. Um, all in favor of the uh, the replacement school on the stagecoach property raise your hand 
All opposed? It's 4 1 with um, Dr. Marchman opposed. Dr. Barrow, I'll turn uh, it back to you. Just last uh, item on the agenda is uh, we do have uh, some information on our career and technical education career planner. I thought you might be interested in taking a peek at that. There will be more information and a more formal presentation down the road, but this was uh, just came out this week, and um, I really appreciate what our CTE folks are doing uh, to create a world-class program in that area. Um, I have no other information at this time. Dr. Barrow? Yeah. Um, Ms. Collins asked me that the board to let the board know that if you want to see the complete planner, it's at FayetteCTE.org. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, I think that's uh, without any uh, objection, we're adjourned. <laughs>